Hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's great to be with you on this Thursday, October 6th. And here's some of what we're talking about tonight. No one should be in jail just for using or possessing marijuana. And President Biden is doing something about that. He's issuing a blanket pardon to benefit thousands of Americans. We'll tell you who and for what charge. Then... I don't know that I have ever voted for a Democrat. Um, but if I lived in Arizona now, I absolutely would. Congresswoman Liz Cheney made that bold statement in a key swing state. Vaughn Hilliard tells us why ahead. A federal appeals court says DACA is illegal, but the dreamers who depend on it have not lost all its benefits yet. What's next for this program and the young immigrants who rely on it? Also, Florida is rebuilding after Hurricane Ian, but should it? We'll consider how climate change might shape storm recovery. What should we upgrade and where should we abandon? And some college classes are hard by design, but how hard is too hard? NYU is buzzing after complaints from students may have cost a renowned professor his job. An editor from the university's newspaper joins us live. You know, it might be just a matter of time before the United States legalizes cannabis outright. Joe Biden expressed support for that on the campaign trail, and today he put that support into action. He issued an executive order pardoning thousands of people with federal convictions for simple marijuana possession. He's also encouraging governors to take similar actions for state charges. The Departments of Justice and Health and Human Services will review how marijuana is regulated under federal law. Currently, it's in the same classification as drugs including heroin and fentanyl. I'm announcing a pardon for all prior federal, offense, federal offenses for the simple possession of marijuana. There are thousands of people who are convicted for marijuana possession who may be denied employment, housing, or educational opportunities as a result of that conviction. My pardon will remove this burden on them. Too many lives have been upended because of our failed approach to marijuana. It's time that we right these wrongs. This order affects about 6,500 people with prior federal convictions and thousands of others with convictions under the D.C. Code. It does not apply to non-citizens, nor does it absolve any other convictions connected to the marijuana possession. Today, the president was in New York. He visited an IBM plant in Poughkeepsie, praising the company for investing $20 billion there over the next decade. IBM is just one firm that's invested since Mr. Biden signed the CHIPS Act in August. That bill subsidizes manufacturing and research of computer chips in the U.S. NBC's Josh Letterman joins us now from Washington with more. Josh, let's start with this announcement about marijuana convictions and those pardons. How will that work? Well, it'll essentially work by the president signing a proclamation, which he did today, uh, which will create pardons for the some 6,500 people who have federal convictions for simple marijuana possession. Now, none of those individuals are in prison solely because of their marijuana possession convictions. But what the president is hoping is that this will really spur governors uh, to follow through by doing the same thing at the state level, because far more people uh, are behind bars because of of state marijuana possession crimes uh, than at the federal level. And the president is also directing the attorney general and the health and human services secretary to very quickly review whether marijuana should remain a schedule one substance under the Controlled Substance Act. That is the highest designation alongside uh, other substances like heroin and fentanyl. Uh, and it has really prohibited a lot of the research on use of medical marijuana uh, because it has been listed as having no legitimate medical use. It's also been listed as having uh, a high risk for abuse. And so the president signaling that he wants to see that designation change, which could certainly change the way that we think of marijuana as a potential medication in the future. 
Yeah, the DOJ did issue a statement saying that the Office of the Pardon Attorney would work on implementing this process to provide certificates of pardon and that they would work with the Department of Health and Human Services to review how marijuana is scheduled under federal law. I think it strikes a lot of people, including the president, as a little weird that marijuana has kind of the highest classification under the Controlled Substances Act, higher than fentanyl, which will kill you with a, a small amount the size of a grain of rice. So I understand the public opinion about where the law is, but what about around Washington? What have some of the reactions been like? Well, certainly we've seen a lot of Democrats, including Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, uh, and others come out and praise this decision by President Biden, saying it is far beyond time uh, for this step to occur. We're also hearing some of the groups that represent uh, marijuana advocates come out and say that this is a, a monumental day for the marijuana reform movement. To be honest, Joshua, we haven't heard that much from Republicans. We haven't heard any major voices saying this is a huge catastrophe. You know, this is something that a lot of politicians from both parties have realized uh, was going to happen eventually. And so uh, really most of what we're hearing so far in response to this has been positives from the Democratic side. We also saw the president in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, north of New York City, touting the Chips and Science Act at IBM. Talk a little bit more about the messaging around that and where that goes from here. I mean, the idea that America brings back some of the manufacturing of this industry that it pioneered has been something the president's been talking about a lot, including in the run-up to the midterms. That's right. And just today in Poughkeepsie, he said, look, we invented these chips. And then somewhere after that, America kind of fell down on the job and all of those jobs shipped overseas. And now uh, it's countries like China, Taiwan and others who really dominate those industries. And so the president intends to use uh, this new opening, this, this $20 billion investment at that IBM facility, as well as other similar announcements to really show that the legislation that he has passed on economic matters in the last several months are making a difference difference are creating a uh, renaissance of American manufacturing that will help lift up the economy over the long term. That is a message of accomplishment that the president is trying to really drive uh, home for people in the final weeks of the election as Democrats try to make the case that they've delivered what they promised. And do we have any sense as to whether or not that messaging is helping? I mean, the latest NPR Marist poll puts his approval rating at 44 percent. It's up from where it was earlier. It was much lower over the summer. Do we have a sense of whether all of this is making a dent? Well, certainly it is better than uh, when he was in the 30s in July in that same NPR Marist poll. Look, the president's approval ratings are still underwater. His disapproval in that same poll is still at 49%. So he's got some struggles. A clear majorities in that poll say uh, that they are very concerned about inflation. And overall, they think the country is headed in the right direction. So what we've seen over the last few months is some modest progress in approval for President Biden and Democrats uh, as some of those economic measures have started to go in the right way. Uh, but overall, voters are still concerned about Democratic leadership when it comes to these economic matters, given how high prices are right now. All right. Thank you, Josh. That's NBC's Josh Letterman reporting for us tonight from Washington. Tonight, Democratic Senator Mark Kelly of Arizona will debate his Republican challenger, Blake Masters. It's one of the midterm elections that could determine control of Congress. But there are other races attracting national attention, too. Arizonans are also electing a governor and a secretary of state. And two nominees on the ballot, both Republican, have denied the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Last night, Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney of Wyoming visited Arizona, and she cast those races in national terms. If you care about democracy, and you care about the survival of our republic, then you need to understand, we all have to understand that we cannot give people power who have told us that they will not honor elections. Elections are the foundation of our republic and peaceful transfers of power are the foundation of our republic. Uh, and, and we must have elected officials in both parties um, who understand and honor that duty and that responsibility. NBC political reporter Vaughn Hilliard is in Phoenix now with more outside the studios of Arizona PBS, which will host the debate. Vaughn, can we just start with what Congresswoman Cheney said? I mean, she kind of 
said that it's more important to defend the democracy than for her to support her party, even going as far as saying that if she was a Democrat in Arizona, she'd consider voting that way. That must have blown a few people's hair back, but not necessarily surprise them considering who it's coming from, right? Right, and Liz Cheney, she was blown out of the water in her own Republican primary here, but she sees an opportunity with her exit out of the Congress at the end of the year, an opportunity to go into places like Arizona where there are those anti-Trump conservatives, those independent voters that potentially she would be able to woo and help convince it's okay to vote Democrat in this election, and here is why. And when you look at Arizona, this is a state that not only did Democrats win the two U.S. Senate seats in 2018 and 2020, but also Joe Biden narrowly won this year. And that is why Trump has endorsed a slate of candidates, not only for the U.S. Senate, like Masters, but also for governor, secretary of state, and attorney general. This is a moment, this is a pivotal race in which Donald Trump would be able to continue to point at these races. And if his candidates could win in this general election to say, this is still my Republican party. So the debate's gonna happen tonight. I see you're at Arizona State's Cronkite School, which is hosting it. What are we expecting from the debate and what's the read on the race right now? Right, this is really the most important week for Arizona politics here because early ballots come in a week from now. And most Arizona voters, they vote by mail and they vote early here. Tonight is the one debate that is gonna be taking place between Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly and Republican Blake Masters. And when you look at the polling, Blake Masters has consistently been down at the same time here. This is a conservative state here, and Republicans feel like they have an opportunity. They have put millions of dollars behind Blake Masters, and along with the likes of Nevada, Georgia, they see Arizona as a pickup opportunity here. Vaughn, it sounds like there's a marching band where you are. Are those demonstrators or protesters, or is that something unrelated to the debate? This is definitely related to the debate, and it looks like there are Mark Kelly supporters here. Again, this is go time here, and I don't even know if you're going to be able to hear me, Joshua, here. But we'll try the best that we can as they make their way through here. Uh, but in a nutshell, when you're looking here at the U.S. Senate debate, uh, Joshua, can you hear me? I got you, Vaughn. Go ahead. We can hear you. here at the state of Arizona here, I think one of the conversations is what issues are most important to voters here. And when you look at the polling from this latest CBS debate here, you see the economy, inflation, immigration, important issues to voters. At the same time, what are the issues that are going to galvanize voters to come out? And when you look at the issue of abortion, I think it's important. It's, there's a lot of nuance in these polls. But when you look at the issue that is most important to Democratic voters, 82% of them say that abortion is a very important issue for them. If Democrats are hoping that that issue can galvanize their voters out, overwhelmingly, to actually be the ones that turn out on election day. All right, thank you, Vaughn. That's NBC's Vaughn Hilliard in Phoenix. Perfect timing. It always works out exactly the way it needs to. This is going to be a very interesting debate if that marching band is any indication. Thank you, Vaughn. Still to come tonight, we have an update on DACA. We'll tell you what a new court ruling might mean for hundreds of thousands of young immigrants here in the U.S. Glad you're with us tonight for Now Tonight from NBC News. Today, more than a dozen people were arrested on Capitol Hill. They were protesting a ruling that could leave more than a half million lives in the balance. Yesterday, a federal appeals court ruled that DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, is illegal. This Obama-era program is designed to spare young immigrants, known as dreamers, from deportation. But despite the ruling, the court allowed those who are already enrolled in DACA to renew their statuses. And that creates a lot of uncertainty. President Biden says he's unhappy with the court's decision, blaming the outcome on the far right. He also expressed his commitment to defending the program. Sources tell us that he's preparing an executive order in case the program is shut down. And some dreamers are speaking out. Jose Munoz was brought to America at just three months old. Today he spoke with Jose Diaz-Balart on MSNBC.
DACA is so integral to the to the American story of being a place that welcomes people, that welcomes immigrants, uh, and this uncertainty at some point, something's kind of have to have to give. This has been 10 years of a program, and we've been litigating this program almost as long as it's been around. NBC Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley joins us now. So, Julia, what's the net effects of the ruling in federal court? What does this mean for DACA recipients and for young people who were hoping to apply for DACA? Well, right now for DACA recipients and for people who had not yet applied, waking up this morning, their lives have not changed, but it may be changing soon. So we know that the program as it now stood had about 600,000 dreamers in it. Those are people, as you said, brought to the U.S. illegally as children, some as young as you just heard from Jose there, three months old. I've spoken to some who came who have no memories of their native countries. They came here a long time ago, brought by their parents. Those people who applied for DACA and have had it can continue to stay here and work and go to school without the fear of deportation. But the court did say they do agree with the lower court that it is illegal and asked the lower court, which has been very uh, antagonistic toward, da toward DACA, Judge Hainan, has said that it is illegal. And, they, and the appellate court asked Judge Hainan to review the new Biden DACA rule, and it's unlikely that he will see that as legal. Also, if this gets bumped up to the Supreme Court, either side could appeal that. That seems likely. We do have some tea leaves that say that the Supreme Court is unlikely to allow DACA to move forward, specifically uh, the work authorization that they've taken issue with in the past even though they allowed DACA to stand. That was just based on the way the Trump administration did away with it. Now that we're actually getting these justices to weigh in on the merits, it's very likely the Supreme Court could end DACA. So for right now, nothing is really changing substantially for those people, but it could be changing soon because the Fifth Circuit said it was illegal and they did not step in to see that it would sustain. What has this meant for the dreamers who are kind of stuck in some un real uncertainty over this? And what have they told you? Yeah, there was a little relief in part, actually. A lot of people thought that the Fifth Circuit might end DACA immediately. Uh, but I was able to speak to one dreamer today, Jessica Estudillo. She is a doctor. She's a pediatric resident. She works in public hospitals in New York. She's worked really hard to get where she is. And she says if she loses work authorization, all of this could go away. Here's what she had to tell me this morning. I go through points in my life when I hear that there's a court ruling or an upcoming challenge to the DACA program, and I kind of spend a couple of weeks like very nervous, very anxious, checking the news. And then once the decision comes out, I feel like I, I get a moment to breathe, um, but it's only temporarily because this only kind of makes me push to do this work more and to kind of be more vocal and put my voice out there and really kind of organize, um, you know, until the next step. So you can see there's a lot of nervousness with each iteration of this. And in the past, what the courts have been weighing in on was the way DACA was started and the way the Trump administration tried to end it. Did they give states enough time to comment? Now it's coming down to the merits of the case, meaning exactly whether or not DACA as it exists is legal or not. And the court yesterday did say it's illegal, although for now they're allowing people like Jessica to renew their status. So that is some temporary relief for people like her. And could you just clarify in a nutshell what exactly the legal argument against DACA is? I mean, what is it about this program that the court considered illegal? Well, it started with a lawsuit from states saying that it was an undue burden on them, specifically with it came to driver's licenses. That was their argument, that even though immigration is a federal law, driver's licenses are issued by states. And so it did, in fact, touch them. And they thought that that was unfair and that this essentially was a way of giving amnesty to people who came in illegally. And so the, the courts weighed in on that. And we also heard today from someone who can put it in better words than I can from Todd Schulte. He's been someone following DACA from the beginning. He's the head of Forward.us, a, a team that definitely advocates for immigration reform and for DREAMers. Here's what he told me. DACA recipients have waited for decades. They do not deserve to live their life in two-year increments. The average DACA recipient came to this country at the average age of six. They've been here for 23 years. This is it in the lame duck session for Congress, and they cannot be fooled by a decision that seems to indicate there's some sense of false security. 
So you can see a lot of pressure on Congress now because while this plays out in the courts, while it goes to the lower courts, possibly the Supreme Court, there's so much uncertainty for DREAMers. And really, DACA always stood to be a temporary measure. This is something that was pushed through in the Obama era, hoping that Congress would then do some substantial immigration reform to uh, Effect, keep these people who came to the U.S. as children in the U.S. But unfortunately, that legislation has not yet passed. So people like Todd Schulte, people like Jessica, and many people across the board, especially Democrats, are calling for legislation for DREAMers, particularly in the lame duck session, because they probably only have that much time until the courts officially end this program. All right. Thank you, Julia. That's NBC Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley with the latest on DACA. We will get to some of today's other top stories in just a moment, including how Floridians are rebuilding after Hurricane Ian and how Ukrainians are taking back a number of villages from Russian control. What has this past week been like for you? Um, difficult. How so? Um, I don't know. I, I tell people I'm in my second hurricane now. I'm just trying to get through all the the, um, the debris and it's hard. Yeah, and you know, trying to figure out how we're going to rebuild. Tonight's headlines begin with Hurricane Ian. It has become the seventh deadliest storm to hit Florida. That's according to NOAA. As of today, more than 130 people are confirmed dead from Ian. The Florida Medical Examiner's Commission says most victims drowned because of the storm surge. Ian's destruction is raising long-standing concerns about storm-damaged properties. Some argue that climate change makes coastal communities too vulnerable to be rebuilt. But Florida's economy relies on these areas. Is there a sustainable future for places like these? And if so, what might that look like? Let's get into that with Jesse Keenan. He's an associate professor of sustainable real estate at Tulane University in New Orleans. Professor Keenan, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me. When you look at the destruction from Hurricane Ian, what's your sense of what the rebuilding might look like, especially if those coastal areas in southwest Florida want to try to be more resilient against the next hurricane? You know, I think it's a mixed bag. I think in certain areas, uh, redevelopment will happen and we will see many of the same patterns that we've seen in the past. And I think in other areas, um, people will find it uh, extremely unfeasible uh, to rebuild not only the housing, but also the infrastructure. And I think we tend to frame this conversation in terms of what people and consumers are going or will be able to do. But I think we've reached a moment where mortgage markets, insurance markets and the capital markets more broadly are actually going to be making decisions that dictate who will be able to rebuild where. Does that mean that the money is not going to be there to rebuild in some of these areas or maybe that the money is not going to be there to rebuild for everybody unless, for example, you have a more affluent homeowner who can afford to put in more of the cost of rebuilding their home, that kind of thing? That's right. This is simply not a good and robust investment for many investors globally who invest in the insurance and mortgage markets. Um, what we are likely to see is what we've been seeing for several decades now in the United States following major hurricanes, which is a concentration of wealth along the coast. That is people who may or may not necessarily need insurance, who have uh, a fair amount of wealth to sustain these uninsured losses. Um, and the many areas of this coast will rebuild, but it will rebuild with a population that's essentially wealthier than the population before the storm. This is a trend we've seen all across, particularly the eastern part of the United States. There is always hue and cry after a storm like this about why do people live so close to the Gulf? Why do people live so close to the ocean? Don't they know about climate change? Isn't that a dumb place to live? Why would anybody live there? My family lives near the Florida coast. We are 10 miles from the Atlantic Ocean and have lived there for generations. And I would have a hard time telling my family, my multi-generational family, you know, from the little boys, my cousin's kids, to my 104-year-old grandmother, y'all have to move. So there are human issues behind where people live. 
What do we say to people who live in areas that are absolutely threatened by climate change, but who may not be able to just uproot? Yeah, it's a massive challenge when we're talking about households and communities, but now also the economy moving off of the coast. Um, We're not just seeing people uh, making decisions about where and how to live. We're actually seeing the real economy making this decision. I think the best way to frame this is decisions that we make about consuming housing. Uh, When we're shopping on Redfin or Zillow to rent a home or to buy a home, there's a lot of accessible information now like Climate Check, uh, that allows one to understand what their potential risk is. And I think having greater disclosure about prior events, but also having greater consumer accessibility in terms of information about what future climate risks may be in any particular area, that's where we begin this conversation in shifting uh, migration, uh, or at least a a deconcentration away from the most risky areas It doesn't mean that we're going to abandon Florida. It just means that we need to make smarter decisions about accounting for risk associated with extreme precipitation, sea level rise, and the increased intensity of hurricanes. Now, a lot has been made about ways to make communities more resilient to climate change. There's a community called Babcock Ranch that NPR News did a piece on that came out of Ian with basically no damage. I mean, they buried their power lines, they built retention ponds to absorb floodwaters. They did a lot of the things that have been very, very smart and frankly have been debated in Florida for a really long time because burying power lines that are strong costs a lot of money. I wonder if there are certain things that we can do if we just take, say, sea level rise in these coastal communities that could make them more resilient for the longer term. Maybe not everywhere, But in the areas that are salvageable, what are some of the things that might look different in a community of the future? Well, I've got to say that bearing power lines actually pays itself off. Uh, It's not as expensive as as you would think. Utility companies have pushed back for a long time on that. Um, But the reality is, uh, given the frequency of storms, uh, these tend tend to pay back certainly within 10 years. I think there is a, uh, Florida is extremely well known for having very advanced building codes. I think in areas where we can uh, make investments in higher quality and engineered, um, uh, engineering resilience in terms of building structures and infrastructure, we can do that. We have that technology, but guess what? Not everybody can afford that. Um, The uh, material investments, the design investments um, to really bring up uh, the level of design standard that we would expect for these kinds of events um, is, um, it's not prohibitively expensive, but there are many people that would not be able to afford this. So we have to think about a diversity of households, uh, incomes, and populations. Uh, and it, whenever we go that route of finding a technological fix, we got to understand who can really afford this and who gets left behind. And very briefly, before I have to let you go, the National Weather Service has a warning for parts of San Diego County that a dust storm is making its way in from Imperial County to the San Diego County lines called a haboob that's carried on a a weather front. Before I let you go very briefly, are we paying too much attention to coastal communities when maybe there are other kinds of communities with other kinds of weather hazards that also need this much attention? I think one of the biggest challenges we have uh, for communities is drought and declining stocks of available potable drinking water. We're running out of drinking water in many places in this country. Entire neighborhoods are having to get water shipped in. We're looking at wholesale condemnation of neighborhoods, which impact the tax base and has all kinds of implications in terms of everything from public health to childhood development. So uh, Coasts are one thing, and that's an immediate challenge, but we have a full range of challenges that have some attribution to climate change. Tulane Professor Jesse Kernan, uh, Jesse Keenan, excuse me, appreciate you making time tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. The civilian death toll continues to rise in eastern Ukraine. Police say more than 500 bodies have been recovered since troops recaptured Kharkiv last month. Most of the bodies were found at mass burial sites in Izum. Police say they also found evidence of torture chambers, and our own Richard Engel has shown us some of that. Meanwhile, control of the Zaporizhia power plant is in question. The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency met with President Zelensky today in Kyiv. He declared that the IAEA deems the facility Ukrainian, despite Russia's attempts to illegally annex the region. 
Residents of Zaporizhia are recovering after a missile strike destroyed an apartment block. It killed at least three people and injured a dozen more. NBC's Cal Perry has more from Ukraine tonight. Hey, Cal. Joshua, that offensive by Ukrainian forces continuing to take place in the eastern part of the country and in the southern part of the country, it is happening fast. In fact, at one point, we think maybe they moved that line some 10 to 14 miles in just one day. They're breaking through the lines in some places. In other places, we understand that Russian forces are just abandoning their post. In some of these cities in the south, we've seen video of Russian bodies lying in the streets, the bodies of Russian soldiers, an indication, once again, that Russian Russia does not control the battle space that it claims to control. The issue here in the capital of Kyiv is one of fear, though, as these battlefield gains are made. People here are more and more concerned about the rhetoric that Vladimir Putin is putting out, especially that of nuclear attacks. And it does seem like the Russians are lashing out in places. There was an attack in Zaporizhia today, killing at least three people, wounding an unknown number of others. This was a residential building that was hit. And according to President Zelensky, the building was hit. The Russians waited for the rescuers to arrive at the scene, and they hit it again. The other thing looming over this country is what is going to be likely a bitter winter. We had a chance today to spend the day with the USAID Administrator Samantha Power. She was here on the ground to talk about that $9.89 billion that USAID has pledged. And while this is a city, Joshua, that is returning to normal, that is filling up, there is traffic on the streets, it's still a place where the war is never very far away. Take a listen to one of her answers during our interview and keep your ear out for the sound of an explosion. U.S. support for this cause is so worth it. Um, we have provided now more than $25 billion in a combination of military security assistance that everybody's familiar with, also direct budget support, $8.5 billion of direct budget support. That is what is helping the Ukrainian government pay the salaries of people who work in government ministries who keep the heat on in the winter. It is helping pay the salaries of health workers. What's at stake here is the question of whether a large power can invade a neighbor and get away with it. All the while, they continue to make grim discoveries in places where Russian forces have left. About a month ago, there was that mass grave discovered in the town of Izum. And we understand now, according to the New York Times, the lead investigator in the Kharkiv region is upping that death toll. Originally, there were 447 bodies found. They now say they have recovered 534 bodies. And again, what was a mass grave and an area that surrounds that mass grave. We saw this happen in the capital, Joshua. Again, in the city of Bucha, where we saw that massacre, bodies were continued to be discovered for weeks after the Russians withdrew. Joshua. All right. Thank you, Cal. That's NBC's Cal Perry reporting from Ukraine. And it is more than bodies that's being found. Russian soldiers retreated from parts of Ukraine in a hurry, and they left a lot behind. Now Ukrainian troops are rummaging through all of what's left. From our partners at Sky News, special correspondent Alex Crawford has the story. They're hunting for Russians. The Ukrainian military blitz is so fast, the Russians can't flee quickly enough. Several have already been found hiding in these abandoned and bombed buildings. The cleanup task force has its work cut out for them. In every dark room, behind every door and in every corner, there's potential danger. And nowhere is safe right now. They're wary of a frightened army, which may have left behind some deadly surprises. The Ukrainians are going through all this destruction and all these villages to try and find Russians who've been left behind, but also any booby traps that might have been left here. Everyone is questioned. Often they've hidden their documents. They can be a lifesaver when everyone is viewed with suspicion. But in the back gardens and fields, the scars and terror of war linger like ghastly statues. They're not sure it's detonated yet, and any wrong move could be catastrophic. The battle has moved on, but the terrors of war remain. The Russian troops turfed residents out of their homes to set up their bases. This was one of them, but they seemed to do little fighting. 
Алкашнев, можно сказать. Ну, знаем. Ну, они вояки никакие. Им, о, понимаете. Ну, правда, кое что они воровали, не без того. Ну, а что ты вояки скажешь? Ну, нихера ты ему And every home they've taken over is like this. A chaotic scene of troops who lived in squalor. They took over flats and they commandeered apartments. All the signs point to an ill-disciplined group. We found human feces on this carpet floor and they fled in a panic. More, more bottles of... Looks like they left in a, a real hurry. Still some patties on the pan. And they apparently abandoned colleagues who weren't quick enough. Who was blinded, there was no navigation. And they fell right into our hands. They didn't know where to go, it's cold. Eat if you want. The Russians abandoned vehicles and so much more. They left quickly, but... Uh, a lot of weapons, they stay here. A lot of weapons... Uh, they left and, behind. And, yes, anti-tank weapon. And the level of destruction is quite staggering. The bombardment left a trail of death and fear, especially for elderly residents like Tatiana. It's left every living thing terrified. She and her neighbors buried her husband outside their home as the shelling continued around them. Part of her died when she lost her soulmate. And there are claims of war crimes too. Galina takes us to where her sister and nephew died, killed, she says, by Russian soldiers. She's looking for what remains of their possessions. This is my nephew's shoe, she says. Oh. And my sister's slipper. They were traveling in an ambulance. Her nephew was badly hurt, and witnesses say the Russians fired on them when they failed to stop. That's all that's left of them, she says. What happened next is unclear, but her relatives and the driver were buried together where the Russians were camping. Witnesses say there was an explosion, and we found vehicle remnants nearby. Galina's consumed with sorrow. The torment of what's happened here will last long after the troops have left. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Yampol, East Ukraine. In Thailand, authorities are investigating a gut-wrenching crime. At least 38 people are dead after a shooting and stabbing spree today at a daycare center. The victims include 24 children and a teacher who was pregnant. A police spokesperson says the suspect is an ex-officer. He reportedly went on that rampage just hours after appearing in court on drug charges. He then fled the scene, driving through a crowd, shooting bystanders before coming home. And there, he killed his wife and their child, and then himself. This is the deadliest mass shooting in Thailand's history. No word so far on a motive. Up next, we'll focus on data privacy. Some student athletes in Florida will have to share personal health information, but where the data is stored has some parents concerned. That's just ahead. Stay close. High school athletes often have to take physical exams, but some requirements in Florida schools are raising concerns. Officials there are asking female high school athletes questions about their menstrual cycles, their timing, durations, and frequencies. Some parents and teachers spoke out after one school district outsourced this information to a third party. NBC's Hallie Jackson has the story.
If you want to play school sports in Florida, state law says you've got to answer a bunch of medical questions. I can understand why a, a coach or administrator of a school might need to know about uh, uh, an athlete's uh, medical issues. That's certainly reasonable. For female athletes, there are even more questions, optional but personal, including details about menstrual cycles, like when did you get your first period? When was your most recent period? And how much time passes usually between your periods? These questions aren't new, but in Palm Beach County, how the answers are being stored is. In August, the Palm Beach County School District signed a contract with Activate, a school sports tech firm, to help its teams manage student medical and other related data. And that has some parents alarmed. There's no need for it. It could be done another way through the school board. We don't have to even go to a third party system. And I'm worried about her future, of course, in regards to like, what are they doing with that? The company says it doesn't sell student data, but it does allow sharing anonymous data unrelated to health for research purposes. We very much respect parents' uh, privacy rights. But with a subpoena, the company acknowledges it could be obligated to share medical information with law enforcement. And in a post-row world, critics say storing reproductive health data with a third-party online platform could leave personal information vulnerable. We're in a post-row world and people are actively trying to take away additional women's rights. As an advocate for young women, I would, I would just not want them to be giving away information they don't need to. Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs is working to address those concerns, proposing a bill that would create a new national standard for reproductive medical data online. What we are trying to do with the My Body, My Data Act is that we don't have any exceptions. So your reproductive and sexual health data cannot be shared without your express written consent, period, the end, no exceptions. And we think that's really important in states like Florida, like Texas, where we are starting to see this kind of data that could be used against people in these states where abortion is being criminalized. Back in Palm Beach County, after some pushback from parents, the district updated its policy, once again allowing paper submissions of those medical forms. They say parents who don't want their kids' information stored with Activate have to reach out to the company directly to request that it be removed. It shouldn't be on each individual person to figure out how to keep their data safe. This is some of our most sensitive and personal data, and it deserves the highest level of protection that the government can give. And some now concerned about what the future holds. If they did it with this medical information for right now, what's next? That was NBC's Hallie Jackson reporting. Some students at NYU say they were struggling to pass organic chemistry, but their former professor says he got fired after they complained about his course's difficulty. We'll consider how hard is too hard with a student journalist at NYU before we go. When I was in college, I got C's in Calculus 2 and Chemistry 2. Thank goodness or I actually might have gone to medical school after all. Some college courses are hard on purpose, clarifying whether students should pivot or persevere. But how hard is too hard? Consider the case of Maitland Jones Jr. For years, he taught organic chemistry at Princeton. It is a notoriously tough subject, but he wrote the book on it, a textbook 1,300 pages long. Recently, Professor Jones was an adjunct at NYU. But just before this fall semester started, the university let him go. This followed a number of complaints from some students claiming that his class was way too hard. The professor blamed some students for their lack of focus. He says the pandemic exacerbated things. As for his dismissal, he wrote in part, quote, students were misreading exam questions at an astonishing rate. In the last two years, they fell off a cliff. We now see single digit scores and even zeros, unquote. Jones told the New York Times he doesn't want his job back, but he also says he doesn't want this to happen to anyone else. Meanwhile, a statement from NYU says the university, quote, disagrees with and is disappointed by the way the matter with Professor Jones has been characterized, unquote. However, the university also said that when the professor learned of his dismissal, quote, he ceased the final grading of his current students' work and left everyone in the lurch, adding, quote, in short, he was hired to teach and wasn't successful, unquote. So who's right in all of this? And what might this tell us about how to help today's students thrive? Joining us now is Arnav bin Ikea. He's an editor with the Washington Square News, NYU's independent student newspaper. It recently published an editorial criticizing the Times' account 
of this controversy. Mr. Benikia, welcome. Good to have you with us. Hi, thanks for having me. So what is this about? I wonder how NYU students are talking about this in terms of whether this is just an isolated incident or whether this reveals something bigger about NYU that needs to be discussed or, or what? How do NYU students view what's happening? I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of the conversation about this uh, stems from the New York Times piece that was published uh, earlier this week. Um, prior to that, it was only a very small subset of the student population that um, really even knew that this was happening. And, you know, ever since that piece was published, I think that um, a good number of students, um, students that I've spoken to um, and, you know, things I've seen on social media, a good number of students seem to feel that, um, you know, the, the way that... Um, the story characterized um, the students' involvement in Professor Jones's firing was um, was was inaccurate. It placed the blame on the students when you know uh, what we found was that there was um, you know a long history of complaints against Professor Jones, and you know in at the very end of it, at you know the the end of the last semester, just before he was fired. Um, the, you know, the students themselves didn't actually ask for this to happen. The, end, the New York Times responded to the editorial. The spokesperson said that the piece was thoroughly researched and reported, and we stand by its publication. That's uh, part of a statement from a New York Times spokesperson. Did you find anything in your reporting, any primary source material, any factual evidence that would refute the Times' account of what happened? I'm sure that they'll point to what their reporter dug up. Did you find anything concretely that refutes the timeline? Um, well, I think that the, the biggest sort of uh, concern that we had um, when we made our decision to write this editorial was that, was, was, you know, not so much that, you know, any of the facts presented in the piece that the New York Times published were incorrect, but more so that, um, that, that, you know, it just didn't tell the full story. Uh, you know, there was a, a, a large section of this story that seemed to, uh, you know, characterize NYU students and, you know, any student today, um, Gen Z students, as, um, you know, lazy or, you know, defiant of the university. And, you know, this, the, the, the story itself didn't actually, you know, speak to any current NYU students, or, you know, if they did, they weren't quoted in the piece. The only student quoted is a former student who has since transferred out of NYU. So we really felt that, you know, what was um, wrong with the piece was that there were things missing. Um, you know, the student perspective was missing. Uh, the perspective of other faculty at NYU was missing outside of the chemistry department. Um, you know, faculty who, after, you know, the publication of this piece and after this sort of conversation that's being had about this piece are now worried about their own job security. Could this happen to them? Well, there are a few other students that are quoted in the story, including a Ryan Shui, who said he took the course and said he found Dr. Jones both likable and inspiring. So it does seem like there are a couple of different accounts in this piece, but maybe, and maybe you can help me through this. I feel like, I, just, I don't want us to get stuck in the weeds of the details of the piece, because I think this is about something a little bit larger as well. I mean, there's a long conversation going on now about Gen Zers and, and, and millennials and, and how they're impossible to work with and impossible to train and impossible to teach, and they're just impossible, but they're our future. <laughs> you know, it's like nobody knows what to do with young people your age, but everyone's rooting for you. And the pandemic, I think everyone suggests, has changed the way teachers teach and students learn. What do we do with this, especially with courses like organic chemistry, like some journalism courses that are designed to kick your butt and make you come back for more if you're really up to the task? How do we help students in your generation thrive without lowering the bar? Well, I think that, um, you know, for, for any professor that's, that's, that's teaching one of these students, that's, that, that, that's teaching one of us or, you know, is... is uh, sort of teaching during and after the pandemic um, in the next few years, uh, I think it's important to understand that, you know, this is a shared responsibility. Uh, you know, for a lot of students, it was incredibly difficult to adjust to, um, you know, all the sort of the new ways that, that we've, you know, been asked to learn because of the pandemic, all the restrictions that we've had. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, in this case in particular, it, it seemed as if, you know, that sort of adjustment was, was being made on one side by many of the students, or at least they say so, um, and not as much by the professor who, 
uh, you know, some students that, that we spoke to in our reporting for the editorial characterized as um, unwilling to, you know, make any changes to uh, adapt to, you know, what is um, obviously, you know, a very difficult, you know, different style of teaching caused by the pandemic. I do want to note that there was at least one NYU professor, Carlos Carmona Fontaine, who tweeted about this and said that this isn't about the story of a great academic fired due to complaints. It's the story of a professor who didn't want to change his old teaching methods. Before I have to let you go, I've only got a few seconds left. For the old school folks who say, you know what, if you don't like how tough it is, maybe that's exactly what a weed out course is supposed to do, weed you out. What would you say to them very briefly before we go? Well, I would say that, you know, this that that might be true, but this situation with Professor Jones isn't that. You know, there is a history of you know this this professor being um, you know unwilling to make this change. So, it, what you know, there are some courses that are difficult, and you know, I think right. that students today are you know quite often able to rise up and uh, you know do well in them. I just don't think that this is one of those cases. Arnav bin Ikea, editor-in-chief of the Washington Square News. Appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. And thank you for making time for us as well. Love your thoughts on this or anything we discussed tonight. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail or send us an email. But until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.